Well, welcome back. Welcome back to Unapologetically Black Unicorns. And I always say, oh, I have the most exciting guest because I do have the most exciting guest. And today is no exception. And I'd like to say good morning and welcome to Unapologetically Black Unicorns to the High Priestess Unapologetically Black Unicorn herself, (laughs) Assistant (laughs) Secretary Miriam Delphin Rittman. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on. I'm so excited to have you here. And as the audience knows, I do not read bios. I let people introduce themselves, but I'm going to ask this one question as a start. Assistant Secretary of what? (laughs) Good question. So I'm the Assistant Secretary of Mental Health and Substance Use within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, and the Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. So it's it's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a mouthful. And yeah, but especially um, I lead SAMHSA. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so what were you doing like prior to that? Like you just didn't get born and then woo, I'm the assistant secretary of SAMHSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so you know, so before this role, I was the commissioner in the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I, I held that role for uh, six years. And then prior to that, I was deputy commissioner for a period of time and uh, also director of the Office of Multicultural Health Equity at the Connecticut State Department of Mental Health. Um, And while I had those roles with the state, I was also on faculty uh, at Yale. And so it was a part of a partnership that the university had with the state. Um, So it really allowed me to have sort of my feet in in sort of two worlds, state government, but then also academia and was able to do work at Yale. And then through my work at Yale, I was able to do consulting at the at the national level. So um, often did uh, training and, uh, you know, with SAMHSA as a as a consultant and work with other SAMHSA contractors to do training for grantees. Wow. Wow. And so what made you actually choose a behavioral health career and like how did that career get started? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's so funny. Careers are often so circuitous in the ways that they happen. You know, I think, I think for me, you know, certainly some of my early exposures came about because my my uh, father was a psychiatrist. Uh, he's retired now, but you know, early on when I was in college, I I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to major in. I was uh, I remember doing English and creative writing, and I was really passionate about that. Thought I would do some short stories and plays, uh, but then I also figured, well, if I take a psychology class, it will help me with character development. So I took one psychology class and just loved it. And the instructor did such a great job of engaging us and having discussion with cross members of the class. And so I just took more and more psych classes and decided, you know, I really, I love this. This is, this is what I want to do more work in. And then I think my pivotal experience is when I worked as a case manager after I graduated from college in New York City in 1989. I never did like that term case manager, but I did, yeah. you know, work with individuals trying to get them connected to services and supports in New York City in 1989 mm-hmm. and just love that work. Wow. Wow. And I love how you talk about your father being a psychiatrist, similar to some of my other guests. I'm thinking about, um, oh, and this is even kind of tying into SAMHSA, Dr. Anel Prim, who's been a guest on the um, podcast as well. And her father was a psychiatrist and um, actually was one of the first running that what was CSAT at the time. It wasn't CSAT at that time, but, oh, I probably should say what CSAT stands for. It stands for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. It's one of the centers at SAMHSA. Yeah, so it's really interesting to kind of hear how families can be um, inspirational, you know, to to the start of what you're interested in. So who else were you mentored by? You know, I I feel like over the course of my career, I've been so lucky to have just really strong mentors just throughout early in my career, uh, midpoints throughout my career. I mean, I think... Um, early on, I remember one person I was mentored by when I was at Purdue, uh, Purdue University, Myra Mason, and she was the director of the diversity office. Um, mm-hmm. Wonderful. I worked with Myra for a number of years doing leading this team of diversity trainers uh, that came from all different departments across Purdue. And we did diversity training both on campus, but also within the broader community. Uh, this is in Lafayette, Indiana. So there was a lot happening at the time. This was uh, in the early 90s. 
Uh, and so Myra is just a wonderful mentor in terms of helping me to, you know, expand my thinking around um, diversity, which later sort of sparked my interest in the equity work. And so felt really fortunate to have those experiences there at Purdue. And did you get to work with Dr. Arthur Evans as well? I think, yes. I did. I did. Yeah. So, so later on, yeah, yeah. So, you know, after I graduated for, from Purdue, I did my internship at Yale University in the Department of Psychiatry. And as part of my postdoc, I stayed on uh, to do a postdoc and got to work with uh, Dr. Evans while he was deputy commissioner at yeah. the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And Dr. Evans really, I, I think, is, is, is was a pivotal mentor as well, because he really helped to shape my interest in data and the ways in which we can use data to think about systems and to think about, uh, you know, looking across systems to be able to identify disparities and then how we think mm-hmm. about addressing those disparities within systems of care. Um, and that's been a theme across my work. It has been a passion and certainly a theme uh, across my work. Yeah, Dr. Evans is one of my mentors. So (laughs) I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, (laughs) but he really helped me. I was, you know, always very creative and thinking very innovatively and out of the box about, um, you know, how do we improve mental health systems and uh, got to to meet with him and talk with him and found out, look, he's from Philly. We live in Philly and that took care of that. So (laughs) so that's great. Like how these uh, like different paths cross. Yeah. Yes. When one becomes an assistant secretary at a federal agency, wh- like how do you achieve that level? How, how do people think about, well, that's something I want to do, not something Karis wants to do, but <laughs> you know, for people who want to do that, like how do you achieve that level? Yeah. You know, for me, I mean, you know, and this is the thing I love about, you know, reflecting on just my own career path. And as I've had conversations with others, careers in general, sometimes you can plan them out. And, and um, I think some of the importance of a, of a career is this sort of staying in the flow and staying open to different um, opportunities and conversations that, that open doors. And, and so for me, I think always my interest in working at multiple levels. So working at the local level, at the state level and the federal level. And, and I often had different projects or initiatives that were going on at the local, at the state or at the federal level. And in fact, one of my mentors, Ezra Griffith, uh, who was in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale, he said, you know, when you think about your resume, your, when you're at Yale, you need to every year add something to each section of your resume. And so, well, that fit for me because I was interested in working at those multiple levels anyway. Mm -hmm. I had done, again, consulting uh, with different SAMHSA contractors, uh, doing training, for example, for the PATH program, did a lot of cultural competence training for PATH grantees, participated in SAMHSA technical expert meetings over the years. And then when President Obama became president, he had said that, you know, we invite people to, to send your resume, send your ideas. And, and I did, and ultimately was able to come on board and work at SAMHSA as a senior policy advisor to the administrator at the time. Mm-hmm. But I think all of my ex- previous experience working at the state level, at the local level, and at the federal level um, really helped in terms of uh, my being able to come on board uh, with SAMHSA as a senior policy advisor and even now as, as assistant secretary. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And um, sorry that we crossed paths. It seemed that I was there I think right when you were leaving um, to go back to Yale, and then I was coming on board at SAMHSA. So, so let's yeah. talk about SAMHSA now that we're at this point, and we're going to talk about equity and some of these other things that you brought up. But mm-hmm. we're kind of going to break it down little by little. So, okay. you know, we keep hearing about, of course, that the U.S. is facing a national mental health and substance use crisis. Um, do you agree? And if so, what is SAMHSA doing to help address the crisis? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's such an important question. I mean, certainly the last uh, handful of years, you know, three, four uh, years have been so challenging in terms of adjusting and adapting to the pandemic. Even before the pandemic, we know there were challenges in terms of behavioral health. You know, when we look at current data, we see about two in five adults are experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression. Um, When we look at our overdose data, we see increases in in overdose rates. About 107,000 Americans last year passed from an overdose, which is just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so our work is very much about addressing the behavioral health of the nation. Our budget funds a broad range of prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction services and supports across the lifespan. So for adults, but also for children and uh, adolescents. 
uh, to address uh, behavioral health challenges they may be experiencing. So again, whether it's mental health or substance use, um, but we also do uh, some work in the space of mental health promotion and quite a bit of work in the prevention, uh, substance use prevention space as well. Um, and so ultimately you put all that together and our goal and our mission really is about helping to ad address and improve the behavioral health and the overall well-being of the nation. Wow. I'm glad to hear about sort of mental health promotion and early intervention. I think a lot of times we use the word, yeah, prevention and early intervention. And people get worried about, well, you can't prevent a mental health condition. But I think the couching it under mental health promotion is really helps people maybe to better understand what we're talking about in that area. Yeah. So when you think about the SAMHSA priorities, what are some of the priorities of SAMHSA and how do those impact the behavioral health of the nation? So, you know, we actually just released an interim strategic plan. It is posted on our yeah. website. And um, so we did update uh, the priorities that we've been working with, you know, since I've been assistant secretary. And so we have, you know, five key priority areas and four cross-cutting areas. Um, our priorities include preventing overdose. We know that's so important given the overdose trends we're seeing. Enhancing access to suicide prevention and crisis care. Uh, you know, of course, our 988 work is so critical there and is, is a central part of that work. Also promoting resilience and emotional health for children, youth, and families uh, is an additional priority area. Healthcare integration. So integrating behavioral health and primary care. That's another priority area. And then strengthening the behavioral health workforce. You know, we hear so much mm -hmm. right now about the needs uh, of the behavioral health workforce. And so that's an area that we're focusing on as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, with that, we have four cross-cutting areas, which we see as um, undergirding and really a part of all of those five priority areas. Those include equity, trauma-informed approaches. You know, that's so important, being trauma-informed, recovery. Uh, that is a key principle of our work. And then also our commitment to data and evidence. Uh, and that's a, one of our cross-cutting principles and areas as well. Wow. So we'll make sure to provide a link to the um, interim plan so that folks can have easy access to it since you mentioned it. It's amazing. You talked about 988. Mm -hmm. That's a big conversation. I think I've had three or four episodes solely focused on 988 and crisis continuum. Oh, fantastic. So, fantastic. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for helping us to get the word out there. <laughs> yeah, more, more to come. So, okay. uh, so under your leadership, you know, SAMHSA's led the U.S. transition to 988 as the new way to reach um, the suicide and crisis prevention lifeline. What is the significance of that achievement alone, just like launching 988? We know there's more work to be done but just getting it off the ground is like a yeoman's task, right? Yes, yes. It, it truly was a yeoman's task. I mean, I mean the, the level of just collaboration and coordination across in terms of, you know, within government. So, uh, you know, with SAMHSA connecting with other HHS departments, but also then connecting outside of government with the range of partners at the state and local level. The crisis sort of network, call center network is comprised of 200 call centers, 200 call centers, in addition to backup centers, which we were able to put in place as well. And so it was a, it was a major effort. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly the goal has been to ensure that if people are struggling and they call 988, that they're able to reach a trained, compassionate counselor who will connect them, you know, if necessary to services and supports. And, and so that ultimately is the goal. I love seeing some of the, you know, research about um, how people are helped by the suicide prevention, crisis and suicide prevention lifeline that, you know, sometimes a person just needs somebody to talk to. Yes. You know, they just need that listening ear. And that's yeah. such a large percentage of the calls. I think it's almost about 80%. I'm right. It could be around Yeah, 80%. it's right around 90%. Like a lot okay. of times people don't need additional mobile crisis or to go to a stabilization center. Um, sometimes yeah. just having someone to talk with, to hear them yeah. and hold what they're experiencing in that moment. Um, yeah. It helps the person sort of get through that crisis that they're experiencing. Um, yeah. So over 90% of the calls are managed just through uh, the that conversation uh, in and of itself. Yeah, I like to lift that talking about data and I can be a data geek at a turn <laughs> on, on a dime. Like I'll just get into the numbers, but I think it's such an important statistic because I think there's a uh, misunderstanding sometimes that people will call the number and need something immediately, like they need the mobile crisis team to come or they need hospitalization or, you know, whatever else. But, but I think, you know, if, if we kind of understand that 
really 90% of the calls are resolved by just having somebody to talk to. That's, yeah. that's really amazing and, and speaks to the need. It really is amazing. And, and the thing that I am heartened by is that people are reaching out. When we compare August, if we just look August, this past August to a year ago, 152,000 additional calls came in, uh, yeah. calls, texts, and chats. So that's the other thing. It's not just the calls, but texts and chats. Oh, so yeah. it's really quite an increase. Um, and then when we look at just, you know, just a little bit of the numbers, when we look at, at some of the stats looking at September, this September to last September, we see about a 40% increase in calls, a 200%, 218% increase in chats. And the text is what really gets me a 1,153% increase in the texts that are coming in. Yeah. Um, so we know that that uh, people are reaching out, particularly young folks that are yes. doing a lot of texting and chatting uh, to get yeah. support. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the past couple of years, as we know, has been so hard on the nation and their emotional well-being that having these um, services and supports available, you know, just at that, I was going to say the dial, we dial anymore. I think we tap. <laughs> You know, dial is an old rotary phone, right? You know, just the tap of a 988 or what have you, and then continue to uh, have access to somebody who can, you know, listen to the struggles that a person is going through. It's so critically important. So glad we're doing this work and glad we're continuing to do the work and also looking at, you know, continued support and financing so that it's all sustainable in the end. So you also talked about recovery. So let's not talk about, let's not forget about recovery here. So yes. let's talk about, about the Office of Recovery. It's so exciting, a whole Office of Recovery under the Office of the Assistant Secretary. Yes, yes, yes. I am so excited about that as well. I mean, we were, you know, we launched the office over a year ago. And this past recovery month, you know, we announced that the director of the office and a full team uh, that's part of the office. And already they've got just really fantastic momentum. Uh, you know, one immediate thing that we're working on is developing a national recovery agenda. Uh, and so that national recovery agenda will be informed by conversations and, and work that we did when we did our, our recovery summit this past August, where we invited people from, you know, uh, individuals from recovery, individuals from the prevention field, from the harm reduction field, from recovery, individuals with lived experience, and really just had uh, two days of really looking at and unpacking, you know, what we mean by what we want to see when we think and talk about recovery. And so a lot of that content will help to inform what's going into the national recovery agenda, as well as other conversations that we're having uh, with stakeholders across the country. Um, so really excited about that work. Yeah, that was a bomb.com meeting, if I do say so myself. <laughs> so, it was great to see. First of all, it was one, of course, where you know we're all coming out of being kind of at home. Um, yes. to, so to be able to see our colleagues and our recovery champions and to see the amount of staff at SAMHSA come into the meeting to be a part of the meeting, to listen in. So it wasn't just us kind of in the room talking amongst ourselves with the high level folks or just the recovery officer, consumer affairs folks, to see Dr. Everett there and just yeah. so many people. That was really great. That was really, really great. And the beginning, I know that's the beginning. Yeah. It's truly the beginning. Yeah. And we were thrilled to be able to do that because you're right. I mean, it was probably one of our first big meetings uh, mm -hmm. that we had on site. And, you know, we we use, of course, that biggest room that we have. Uh, mm -hmm. And we would have had more staff there. But, you know, of course, we wanted to keep it safe with COVID. So we didn't yeah. want to pack yeah. the room too much. But sure. it was good that we were able to use the breakout spaces and, and have more intimate conversations. And um, we're, we're grateful. We're grateful for everyone that came to that and attended that, whether it's, uh, you know, folks from outside SAMHSA as well as inside, because we got really, really good content and creative ideas around how we yeah. take the important recovery work that's been happening across the nation, how we take that to the next level um, yeah. and what that looks like. So really excited about uh, some of that work that will be coming up. Right. And it was a great example of how hybrid can be done as well. So you had folks yeah. who were physically in the room as well as people who were participating online and they had their own breakout groups, et cetera. And yes. um, I really appreciate like prior to the meeting, if folks were involved in different listservs that people were getting input from their constituents to bring to the meeting. So it yes. wasn't like I'm there, so-and-so representing myself or even my organization, I'm representing a community of people who have given their input into what they would like to see um, as the recovery office was moving forward. So that, that was really cool. Very, very cool. 
Yeah. And you've also talked about um, equity and an equity focus. So let's talk a little bit about your equity focus work at SAMHSA, um, including Black youth suicide. Yeah. So, you know, um, equity has it's been a long time uh, goal of SAMHSA and, and focal area. We do have an Office of Behavioral Health Equity. And, you know, when I was at SAMHSA previously, the office had had uh, worked on a disparity impact statement. And, and now, and I'll, and I'll share what that is. Now we're putting out disparity impact statement 2.0. Um, and essentially what that is, is for our discretionary grantees, um, they have to um, essentially identify populations that may experience disparities that they're serving, and then come up with a plan for how they'll address those disparities. And we'll provide TA and support to help them with that work that, that ultimately is about reducing disparities and, and promoting equity for individuals that they serve. Another area of work we have is, is sort of the, the work looking at Black youth suicide. Unfortunately, when my goodness, when we look at some of the data, we are seeing, you know, unfortunate increases in suicide rates among um, African-American youth. Uh, and so that has been uh, an area of priority focus for us. Uh, we recently held a, a Black Youth Suicide Summit where we brought thought leaders uh, and young people together from around the country uh, to, to really just unpack and to address and look at this issue in terms of what's happening, what will make a difference, what more can SAMHSA do? And, and ultimately, our goal is, is to be able to just meet the needs, you know, meet the needs across the country of young people and African-American young people that are struggling. Certainly 988 can be part of that. We, you know, we want people to know that if they're having a hard time, um, they can reach out and call 988 and get support. And we're doing work to ensure that the 988 uh, callers, as well as our me messaging is culturally responsive as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so working with trusted community members to include faith communities, to develop messaging, to let people know more about what 988 is and about what it isn't. Um, so right. if they're struggling, they can get help. Wow. You know, I I just wrote down nothing about us without us when you talked about the Black Youth Suicide Summit, same for the recovery meeting. And I think it's such an example of how people can come together in a room and mm -hmm. um, not have it always be segregated rooms. Sometimes, yes, we need our own space to talk about our issues where, you know, we can kind of let it all go, right? <laughs> um, however, like bringing together experts in the field, experts by lived experience um, mm -hmm. and, and youth to talk about and help you think through, you know, what are the things that need to be done? I I think it's just such a good example. So I hope people are listening to that. Yeah, <laughs> As it can you. be done. It can be done. It, it can be done. And, and you know, I think it's vital that it be done if we mm -hmm. want our policies and programs to truly meet the needs of individuals that are having challenges. And, you know, I, I love that mantra, uh, nothing about us without us. When I was commissioner uh, and, and in my work now, I, I, I try to have that at the center of our work. And so the recovery office is very much about that, you know, involving individuals with lived experience in the work throughout SAMHSA uh, and coming up with strategies and approaches to um, advance recovery from an individual program perspective, but also a system perspective as well. Yeah. And so that includes really um, adhering to and implementing that nothing about us without us yeah. mantra. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, you know, I've been thinking about how sometimes, you know, many times, especially as a service recipient, you know, as a person given a diagnosis who was receiving services, that we think about, you know, mental health changes at the individual level when you're when we're talking about maybe treatment, if you will. And mm -hmm. so sometimes we enter into the work, even thinking about it at the individual level, but it's a systemic change that will happen, right? We're looking for systemic improvements. And to me, yes. that's collective and collaborative. So, yeah. you know, kind of switching from that individual mindset to that collective and collaborative mindset is kind of how I think yeah. about it. I love that. I love that collective and collaborative because um, mm -hmm. that is really what it's about. I think that often that's where the work happens, yeah. you know, in terms yeah. of being, uh, you know, contextually aligned and context competence um, to be yeah. able to address sort of needs that people experiencing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's both hard work, H-A-R-D and hard work, H-E-A-R-T. So, um, roll up your sleeves and get ready for it, uh, but you're already doing it. Um, so what what do you want people to know ultimately about mental health and substance use disorders? That recovery is real and recovery is possible. You know, if they are 
um, if they are struggling with mental health or substance use um, challenges, I want them to know that there is support that is available, um, that they don't have to experience and go through what they're experiencing alone. Again, we fund across the country a broad range of prevention, treatment, and recovery programs. So a person can reach out and, and get support, whether it's by calling 988 or if they're looking to connect with a trained counselor, they can also go to findtreatment.samsa.gov. So again, findtreatment.samsa.gov uh, to mm-hmm. connect with a counselor that can support them and help them. Um, so, so that's really what I want people to know, that recovery is possible and help is available. Fantastic. Amen to that. Thumbs up, claps. So (laughs) when people struggle, you know, kind of getting the mental health or substance use care or supports they need, what are what are some of the issues that they're struggling with? Like why is why is that hard for some folks, do you think? You know, I mean, I think there's I think there's a variation there. It it really depends on a person's immediate situation. I mean, for some individuals, it might be transportation. You know, there there may be um, challenges that they have in terms of getting to providers. We're trying to work on that as well. There's there's increased use of telehealth and availability of telehealth services and supports across the country. So a person now can connect with a provider doesn't necessarily have to be in person. They can do audio only. So over the phone or, you know, through a computer um, or even in person. So hopefully trying to, you know, get at the transportation barrier. Um, For other people, it might be stigma, you know, just a concern about accessing services and supports. We know that unfortunately there are stereotypes and, and stigma that we need to continue to work at to, to break down. And so sometimes internalized stigma um, around what this might mean for me or what this might mean mm-hmm. for my family if I access mm-hmm. services and supports. And so certainly we're trying to work on that by um, just giving people more information around the ways in which services and supports can be helpful to break down some of that stereotypes and, and you know, and some of that stigma. And so those are just a, a few uh, areas that may be barriers. Health insurance, you know, may be a barrier for some individuals. We want people to know, though, that even if they are uninsured or underinsured, help and support is available. There are uh, certified community behavioral health clinics across the country that SAMHSA funds that will help people irregardless of their insurance status. And so that is support that's available as well. And of course, we fund states through our block grant, and often many states will have services and supports that are available for individuals and territories as well, Mm -hmm. available for individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was thinking back to, um, first of all, I have to say, this has been a fantastic conversation. I don't know how you hold all this stuff in your head, quite frankly. Um, it's, it's a massive amount of information. Why I would never want to have your job? Again, just saying. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I do want to say that, um, you know, my time at SAMHSA, when I worked at SAMHSA, I have nothing but mad respect for SAMHSA. And Um, the hard work that all the staff do on behalf of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that people know you're one of the smallest operating divisions under the Health and Human Services Department, yet you have this huge, huge task to do. And I just can't thank you enough for, um, you know, being at the helm and leading forward, especially under such incredible times. Mm -hmm. And just hearing what you're talking about today just gives me a lot of hope. It makes me miss SAMHSA a little bit. A lot, (laughs) but glad to be involved kind of on the outer side of it. Um, But, but uh, I'll agree with you too, when you, you said at the beginning of the podcast, sort of your, um, how your mentor was saying, you know, do something at, you know, the state level, the local level, the federal level, Mm -hmm. you know, I think about how did, how was it that I got to SAMHSA and, um, you know, kind of the similar thing. It's like, keep yourself kind of fingers in all levels. Mm -hmm. And when I worked at SAMHSA, quite frankly, I understood how the levels were connected. Yeah. Before it just seemed like there was a level over there, the state was over here, the county was over here, the local was over here, peer run organization that I ran was over here that was just mad at the you know county organization, but not recognizing, oh, well, maybe it's the state. Well, no, maybe it's the feds. No, maybe it's CMS. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it started to put all of the pieces together. And I think that's why it was such a powerful and important experience for me. So yeah. I'm super glad you're there. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And 
and thank you for your time at, at SAMHSA. I still run into people, or often run into folks who say, oh yeah, Karis, so uh, you definitely left your mark here. Uh, so I yeah. uh, know that that uh, you will always be a, a, certainly a friend to SAMHSA, honorary SAMHSA, all of that. <laughs> all of that. <laughs> sort of, uh, yeah, somebody's in my office. Who is it? And she said, what did you do to the lights in here? Because the lights don't work. I said, I didn't do anything. I don't know what happened. Maybe my <laughs> essence is missing. The lights don't work. I don't know. But, um, you know, before we sort of wrap up, I always ask people to do some wisdom dropping. You've dropped sort of, as I say, mad wisdom this entire time, lots of information, and we'll have some links to some of the things that you referenced as well. But before we leave, is there one piece of information, one piece of wisdom dropping that you have for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. You know, I mean, I think an important piece is is just the the whole piece around hope. You know, I, I want uh, the listeners and people across the country just to have hope, to know that there are services and supports that are available if they're struggling with mental health or substance use related challenges, um, and they need not struggle alone. Reach out, get support. There is a broad network of care that is ready to sort of receive and and really wrap around anyone that may be struggling. Um, so do call, you know, 988 uh, or find treatment.samsa.gov uh, if uh, individuals is looking to connect and, and get some additional support. Great, great. Snaps, claps, thumbs up, all of that. <laughs> a S S S S S exclamation point with a couple more exclamations points. So I know you're super busy. Um, you are running an agency after all. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us today. And, um, you know, just really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on and for all the great work that you do every day. So thank you. Sure thing. All right. So for our audience um, and listeners, please remember to you know do all the things you got to do. Subscribe, like, comment. But most importantly, share. I think at the end of the day, I'm hoping people are sharing this information, especially for folks who need access to the wonderful stories and information that our guest is sharing, especially Assistant Secretary Miriam Delphin Rittman. Thank you very much. And guess what? We will see you next week. See you, hear you, listen to you, whatever. Next week on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. <laughs>